Thank you, Dan, and uh, can't recognize Dan enough for all the work he put into making this uh, meeting happen and uh, this society happen as well. Um, we're going to really uh, get down in the weeds uh, with the favorite topic of all the surgeons in the room, glucose control. Uh, I see uh, my uh, fellow surgeons from Duke just snuck in the back uh, just in time for my talk. Thank you, guys. I uh, know you love this topic. Um, it all started in uh, 2001. Uh, with this Belgian study from Vandenberg, a 1,500 patient randomized controlled trial of surgical ICU patients randomized to intensive versus conventional glucose control treatment. And of these patients, 62% were post-cardiac surgery. Uh, and in that subset, mortality was reduced from 5% in the control arm to 2% in the intensive treatment arm. And so this really lets let the sparks fly at programs everywhere uh, trying to figure out how to achieve better control for our post-cardiac surgery patients. The STS um, has weighed in. Uh, Dr. Engelman and, and others um, have uh, given us some very loose recommendations for uh, intraoperative management. There is in here a class one level of evidence B recommendation for an insulin infusion uh, during uh, surgery for diabetics, um, but really there's way more unknown than known. Uh, we don't know how hospitals are doing across the country in achieving glycemic control after cabbage, um, and we don't know what the real world association outside the trial setting is between glycemic control and clinical outcomes. It's something that's discussed a lot, but we don't really know much about. So for the past maybe 24 months or so, we've been uh, working on a study whereby we obtained detailed perioperative data from 48 medical centers in the, uh, participating in the STS national database. We linked those to their own STS database files and then linked them again to American Heart Association files so we could risk adjust at the patient level and at the hospital level and see what's going on with glycemic control. You can see this is a uh, diverse geographic representation. These 48 centers are high quality STS centers from around the country. We started with 2,390 patients, excluded 14 who died within the first 24 hours. Um, uh, I'll mention this was uh, all patients age greater than 65, LVEF less than 40, uh, GFR less than 60. So this was a relatively more comorbid group, which made the study more efficient. We had more endpoints. We excluded 336 uh, who were missing blood glucose data, like there was nothing about glucoses uh, in their charts. So this was 2,040 patients in our analysis, and getting straight to the punchline, this is the variability across these 48 relatively homogeneous, high-quality STS sites. You had 48 percent, the best anyone was doing was keeping 48 percent of their patients in the good control range. And that's good control defined as by the American Diabetes Association as between 70 and 180. That's a pretty broad range. And 48 percent was the best anyone was doing. Some as little as 3 percent of their patients were staying in that range uh, in the first uh, 24 hours post-operation. If we look at hypoglycemia, again, great variability between centers. Uh, not quite as bad as hyperglycemia, but tremendous practice pattern variation across our country. When we looked at post-operative characteristics, these are all risk-adjusted in the good control arm. Hours in ICU were reduced, post-operative length of stay reduced, uh, many others. Um, so the randomized trials seem to be right in everyday practice in that good control is beneficial. The adjusted odds ratio, adjusted at both patient and hospital level for the composite mortality and major morbidity endpoint was 0 0.66, so a significant uh, reduction in the bad outcomes for those with good control. But it's really not straightforward. Um, this scattered plot shows you that uh, of those uh, patients, or those hospitals rather, uh, with a less hypoglycemia, they also tended to have more hyperglycemia. So, you know, no one's really got this uh, lined out perfectly. And in and what you see in real world practice is only 15% of patients achieving good control. Uh, the results of all these prior randomized trials in glycemic control are difficult to replicate in everyday practice, and achieving better control was associated with lower short-term mortality and morbidity. And we hypothesize that insulin use strategy is important as well. 
So what I've just shown you is we've just published in Journal of Critical Care, but this is unpublished. It should be coming later this year, but we started, we went back and looked at, well, how were they using insulin infusions? And, and this is for insulin infusions among uh, those coronary patients that were known to be diabetic. And many centers are using a, a insulin infusion for 100%, some less than 10%. Tremendous practice pattern variation. Same for non-diabetics. Uh, uh, significant variability. So ours is a specialty with great variability in practice patterns. And glucose control is a real um, microcosm for that. Um, ours is also a specialty accustomed to data collection and outcomes reporting. We all have STS data managers. We're used to um, uh, uh, this, this type of mindset of collecting our data, and it's a perfect match for an ERAS cardiac continuous quality improvement um, platform. And so before ever, before uh, Dan and Ed and Louie and everyone formed the uh, ERAS Cardiac Society, um, we dreamed in Raleigh, North Carolina of applying those principles that we had seen uh, work in general surgery to cardiac. Uh, we are we have in press a rationale design and implementation paper on our enhanced recovery after cardiac surgery program. I won't go into the details, but two of the key interventions were a carbohydrate load two hours prior to general anesthesia and goal-directed perioperative insulin infusions uh, for all our patients. The American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and American Diabetes Association state that insulin infusion may contribute to postoperative hypoglycemia and may not always pre prevent hyperglycemia, particularly with the use of a tight blood glucose target range, for example, between 80 and 110. Well, they were right about that. We showed it in our study. Um, and our ERAS cardiac target range for blood glucose uh, is 110 to 150. If we look at uh, um, uh, perioperative carbohydrate treatment, um, uh, as that carbohydrate bolus. There's a recent Cochrane review uh, showing 27 trials, nearly 2,000 patients, whereby carbohydrate loading not only reduced postoperative insulin resistance, but also reduced hospital length of stay. This, is a, this was a real controversial area for our program, giving carbohydrates to a, a patient population that the majority have diabetes. Um, uh, almost all of them are getting transesophageal echocardiography uh, in the operating room. Uh, in these 27 trials, events involving aspiration pneumonitis were not reported, um, all this, although this does remain a uh, concern. So as Dan said, on Monday, we're going to pre pre the, present the results. We show significant reductions in GI complications, significant reductions in length of stay, both ICU and hospital with our ERAS platform. Our post hoc analysis of the incidence of hyperglycemia revealed only 15 percent uh, uh, incidence of hyperglycemia outside of our target range 110 to 150 uh, in the first 24 hours post ERAS cardiac. Um, initiation. Um, our consensus work uh, is going to be presented on uh, Tuesday, um, and we'll hear more about the evidence behind carbohydrate loading and perioperative glucose control using insulin infusions. Um, the next steps in this work um, are going after those high performing centers, um, looking at their specifics of their pump programming and their nomograms. Uh, for best control. Um, we're also talking with industry about the new FDA improved uh, uh, implantable pumps for some of those type 1 diabetics that are um, so difficult to control. Uh, thank you all.